Hi, welcome to SV Online. We have an exciting announcement this week. We want to welcome Devon White as our Director of Students. Now, Devon, you guys have been members of SV for a year now. Yeah. Share, us, uh, share a little bit about your family. Uh, well, I'm a husband of 18 years. We have three biological kids and we have one foster child uh, that became adopted and we have four foster kids that we have as well. Awesome. And so you've led a student ministry for seven years in Baltimore. You've been ministering through music all over the country for the past several years. You were even a Marine and now God has brought you here. Tell us what you're excited about serving for our students. Uh, I'm excited to just see what God is going to do through our students and uh, just connecting together and all of us, you know, pretty much working to make sure that these kids uh, fulfill everything God has for them. Awesome. How can we pray for our students in the ministry in the days to come? Uh, we just pray for wisdom uh, on how we move forward and, and just restructuring everything and making sure that uh, we're following God's will. Awesome. Guys, you're going to love Devon and I can't wait for you to get a chance to connect with them more. Ladies, don't forget our Women's Ministry Welcome Back Lunch on September 12th. You can register online at westbradenorg slash women. We are grateful for your gifts that make all of this ministry possible. Don't forget that online giving is available at give.westb.org. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's worship together. Beside you, all around. 
for you. He is 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 for you. Embarrassing to say that my armpits are like sweating like non-stop right now. <laughs> yeah. Baptism is it's like a wedding ring when you get wedded or well, married. Oh, baptism baptism is when you get pushed in the water and you um die for God and then you rise. Berlin loaves and two fish. He ate, he ate chicken wings, bread, and wine. Yes. <laughs> no. No. Because it's bad for you and it, it's not healthy. Uh, no, because you would get sick. Even for um um, if you if you have Oreos, you can't have dessert. Baptism is a rite that marks the beginning of the Christian faith. The Lord's Supper is a rite that marks the continuation of the Christian faith. But it's not quite that simple. Many of the biggest controversies in church history have occurred because of different beliefs about baptism and the Lord's Supper. Why do we immerse? What are the little cups and those trays? Why? Why do we use grape juice? Well, we're going to answer some of these questions today, and we're in a series called We Believe. And in this series, we're covering several topics that make up our eight-part confessional statement here at our church, West Bradenton Baptist. And we're now to the point of talking about baptism and the Lord's Supper. So let me read you uh, the part of our confessional statement that marks uh, what we believe about baptism and the Lord's Supper. We believe believers' baptism and the Lord's Supper are the two ordinances of the church. Now, we'll start with baptism, and I want to jump right into Matthew chapter 3. So get your Bibles out, turn them on, scroll to where you need to go, open them up. Uh, Matthew chapter 3 is where we're going to begin, and I'm going to read to you verses 13 through 17, and we're going to see a description of Jesus' baptism. So Matthew 3 beginning in verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. Jesus answered him, Allow it for now, because this is the way for us to fulfill all righteousness. 
Then John allowed him to be baptized. When Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. The heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So here Jesus goes to John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist is not your typical guy. He lives in the wilderness. He eats locusts and wild honey. And and Mark actually writes in his gospel that John is preparing the way. Now, this is terminology that uh, in the Greek, the original language implies it's, it's about those who would go out before the king and then grade the road for a smoother journey for the king. And so John the Baptist is, is going out into the wilderness, and then people are, are coming to him to be baptized. He is, in essence, preparing the way for Jesus. The, the wilderness is a theme in the Bible, and it symbolized a a recognition of rebellion, a recognition of being disobedient. And so people were being baptized in the wilderness. What that means is they were admitting that they were wandering from God. Jesus asks to be baptized. And John says, no way, you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, no, you need to allow it. Why would this interchange happen? Why would John not want to baptize Jesus? Well, baptism was for sinners. Why would Jesus need to be baptized? He is sinless. In Mark's gospel, John the Baptist recognizes, he he says this, "I, I have been baptized with water, but he, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. There's a difference between ritual baptism and real baptism. John's baptism was, was momentary. Jesus was establishing an eternal baptism. Jesus' baptism was a sign of fulfillment and an example for all of us. In fact, we see there at Jesus' baptism the Trinity, and the Trinity performs three distinct activities. God the Father speaks from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God the Son is baptized by John the Baptist. If God the Father, God the Son, and then God the Holy Spirit descends from heaven like a dove, and empowers Jesus for ministry. Now, why do we immerse people in the water for baptism? Well, that's how the practice began in the early church. In fact, in the earliest baptisms that we see in Scripture, there was this immersion of people, uh, typically in a river or a large body of water. And the Greek word for baptism is baptizo, which means to plunge or to dip or to immerse. So that's why we practice baptism the way that we do, because that's the way the church started it, and that's what the word itself means. And when this practice started, people were baptized in the water, not by the water or near the water or beside the water. It was in the water. But most importantly, Jesus' baptism was by immersion. It says there in the text that he came up from the water. We see examples of other baptisms in the Bible. I mean, when Philip shared the gospel with the Ethiopian, they they came to some water, it says in Acts chapter 8, and then went down into the water and then came up out of the water. Baptism is also a powerful symbol of your salvation in Jesus. So there's another reason we do it. It's it's the symbol of what it means. I mean, you've got this act of going down under and then back up out of the water. You've got the death of Jesus represented by that downward movement. Um, Jesus sacrificed for us on the cross. He he died for us. And so we see that represented in the baptism. But then we have the the burial of Jesus, the fact that we go under the water. He he died to be our mediator. He died to be our substitute. He's, He's the way that we get to God. We can't get to God apart from Jesus. But then the resurrection's the best part, the coming up out of the water. God raised Jesus to prove that eternal life was true. So at our church, this is why we don't sprinkle babies, for for example. Um, We baptize adults by immersion. And the reason that we baptize adults, or not just adults, but people who can profess faith in Jesus, that's why we call this believer's baptism. Uh, someone who has confessed 
Christ. So this would be um, somebody who acknowledges and cognitively, somebody who acknowledges or who knows uh, that they have confessed Jesus. Your parents cannot do that for you. It is a decision that you must make for yourself. So baptism is not necessary for salvation, but it is necessary for obedience. Now, there's nothing in the nothing magical in the water when we baptize. It, whether we go to the beach or whether we have the baptism in our baptistry, it, it's, it's, not, it's not the water itself. The water doesn't wash away your sins. Jesus does that. So the baptism is not a means of grace, uh, but it is a very powerful symbol that is, that is an important mark in your walk with, uh, with Christ. And so we know it's not a means of grace because of what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. He says, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. So no, no act, no work can save you. Only God's work can save you. So the baptism as an act doesn't save, but it is a representation of your salvation. There is a specialness to the obedience, the act of obedience, any act of obedience, but especially baptism. So this is why we call baptism and the Lord's Supper, which we'll talk about here in a second, ordinances. We, we call them ordinances because they are ordained or commanded by Jesus. Now, does a pastor have to perform a baptism to make it valid? Actually, no. We believe that Anyone has access to God through Jesus. In fact, we find this in, in the Great Commission. So get your Bibles out, turn them to Matthew chapter 28. We're gonna look at two verses here, verses 19 and 20. Go therefore, this is Jesus speaking, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. So we have several things here that we're supposed to do as believers. So we, we rest in Christ who has all authority, we go, uh, and then we baptize, we teach, we um, do everything God has commanded us to do. And so we have the Great Commission. We are all to make disciples. We are all to share our faith. We are all to baptize. And since baptism is a sign of entering into the body of Christ, which is the church, it is wise to have this act of obedience done within the fellowship of the church. So the reason that we baptize in our church or we baptize with our church, if we go out to the beach, for instance, is because it's, it's an, it's, you're entering into the body of Christ, so there needs to be a connection to the church. But any church member is free to baptize another member within the context of our local church. In fact, Recently, we had, a, we had a husband who baptized his wife. It was a beautiful picture. It was exactly what God would want to happen. So baptism is the introduction into the church done once. The Lord's Supper is a continuing practice by believers. Now, some may call baptism and the Lord's Supper sacraments. And the reason that somebody would say it's a sacrament is because typically because the word sacrament is tied to the Greek term for mystery. And these two rites, baptism and the Lord's Supper, are to some degree mysteries of, of the faith, which is why they're debated and why so many people have different views of baptism and the Lord's Supper. But here's what we believe. The Lord's Supper unites believers in a collective act of obedience. So let's change gears a little bit from baptism to the Lord's Supper. This is a collective act of obedience. In fact, I remember the first time as a pastor that I administered the Lord's Supper. Um, it was at my first church called Union Band Baptist, and they had this tradition, and I certainly wasn't about to try to do away with the tra tradition, but they had this tradition of using a very old silver set, and I don't know how old this silver set was, but it's probably 200 years old. It was probably the, the age of the church. The church was a very old church, been around since before the Civil War. Now, they had not had services in a very long time. They had not had done the Lord's Supper. They couldn't even remember the last time that they'd done the Lord's Supper. And so we, we got this silver set together and they, you know, they, they filled up everything with the juice and all of that. Here's the problem. I think, you know, we're talking about a 200-year-old church. 
I think that really was the last time that this silver set was cleaned. And when I tasted that grape juice, I thought that I had drank condemnation on myself. First time ever, Lord's Supper, as a pastor, I managed to mess it up. But I think God honored our hearts. I think God understand, understood the, the act of which, the collective act of obedience that we were all trying to do. Now, some may call the Lord's Supper, uh, this act of the Lord's Supper, Eucharist, uh, which references the Greek word for Thanksgiving, because that's what Jesus did. He gave thanks at the Last Supper, which became the Lord's Supper. Others may say communion, because there is this concept of sharing uh, built into the Lord's Supper. Some churches celebrate the Lord's Supper every week, others do it monthly, some quarterly, some annually. Now, for us, the reason that we do this more often, typically uh, over 10 times a year, is because Jesus said, do this as often as you drink it. And often for us uh, is, is more than once a year, more than four times a year. It's, we, we try to do it about once a month. Um, and it's a way, so it's not so much that we get all the numbers right in the number of times, but really what this is, is it's a way that we unite together in obedience. The more you follow God's will as an individual, the more we will be united as a church collectively. So the Lord's Supper is a picture of intimacy with God. Jesus didn't give us a theory to study to understand his way of redeeming humankind. He gave us an act to perform. He gave us a, a picture of intimacy, a meal to partake together with. He, he gave us a, a simple way of remembering a meal. The symbol of the meal goes back to the very beginning. Genesis 2 says, the Lord placed Adam with Eve in the garden and commanded them that any fruit is good to eat, except for one fruit. And then Genesis 3 records the first sin, which came from the first recorded meal. But it was a, this meal was a twisted fellowship with God. They ate the one fruit they were not supposed to eat. This is what we mean by the forbidden fruit. It was the first sin. The first recorded meal in the Bible was one of broken fellowship with God. Then, as we get further into the Old Testament, we have another important meal that appears, the Passover meal. And this is the story of God freeing the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. And, and this story foreshadowed Christ, who would be the Passover lamb, who was slain so God's wrath would pass over us. There's lots of meals in the Old Testament. Then we get to this New Testament meal, this Last Supper that Jesus has with his disciples. And the Last Supper was a Passover meal. And, and, and what Jesus does is he fulfills the Passover. What was a meal from the Old Testament, Jesus becomes the fulfillment of it. So in fulfilling the Passover, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper at the Last Supper. It's called the Last Supper because it was the Last Supper before his crucifixion. And the world, what happens now through this meal is that the world now understands that they can be reconciled to God through the Passover lamb. And what was broken at the first meal in Genesis is restored in a meal with Jesus. Now, there's several meal scenes in Luke. And the, in, in the seventh meal scene in Luke, the, that last supper, you see injustice clashing with one of Israel's most holy events, the Passover feast, you see this intimacy in a, in a meal juxtaposed next to a betrayal by Judas. So let's go there. Let's look at this Last Supper, uh, which becomes the Lord's Supper. Turn with me to Luke 22. So get your Bibles out, turn them on, scroll to where you need to go. Luke 22. I'm just going to read two verses here verses 19 and 20. So this is Jesus at the Last Supper. Here is what he says. Luke 22, verse 19. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. 
Jesus, in saying this, breaks with the meal's tradition. He says, the bread is my body. The, the cup is my blood. The bread, my body. The cup, my blood. God's plan of redemption, I mean, occurring as he foreordained from the beginning of time, would, would soon be fulfilled in Christ. But it would not come without a betrayal. And so here at this meal scene, we get the stark contrast of Jesus and Judas. There in Luke 22, verse 22, Luke records, he says, For the Son of Man will go away as, as it has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. What we learn through this meal scene, this Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, is that proximity to Jesus doesn't save you. Just because you're close doesn't mean that you're saved. Judas betrayed Jesus and he was there. The story of an intimate meal with Jesus' disciples, a meal where he would reveal what he must do to save humanity is interwoven with a picture of betrayal. Judas, we make him out to be a monster, but he, he was no monster. He actually serves as an example of what can happen to anyone in close proximity to Jesus without a relationship with Jesus. Look at what Satan did at the temptation of Christ. In Luke chapter 4, verse 13, it says, After the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from Jesus for a time. See, the devil left Jesus for a time to wait on a better opportunity. He couldn't tempt Jesus. At least he couldn't get Jesus to cave into temptation. But the devil could lure someone close to Jesus. It's a picture that remains today every time we take the cup and the bread. It's a picture of sinners with the sinless. It is truly grace that Jesus went to the cross knowing that we would look at the bloody brutality that was there and think that we are somehow deserving of that sacrifice. It's it's not our love. It's not our love. It's not your love that attracts Jesus. It's Jesus' love that changes us. This is grace. This is the picture of the Lord's Supper. This is what baptism represents. The gospel. Good news. Jesus saves. Let's play a game. I'm going to show you some symbols, emoji symbols, and they make a phrase. You have to figure out the phrase. Ready? Let's try it. Okay, here's our first one. Look at it really carefully. Can you tell what it's saying? It's corn dog. All right, here's number two. Look carefully. Raise your hand if you guessed Burger King, because that's it. All right, here's number three. Number three is Snow Angel. Did you get that one? All right, this one's a little bit harder. Let's look. All right, what do you think it is? That one is bow and arrow. All right, last one. This is my favorite. Look at it carefully. Did you guess Ice Ice Baby? Because that's it. Get it? Ice Ice Baby. How'd you do? Did you get all five? Emojis are fun symbols that we use to represent how we feel or what we're thinking. If I send you a heart emoji, you know that that represents love. Today, Pastor Sam has shared with us about two ordinances or very important things that the church does, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Both of these are very important in the lives of our church and in our faith. Why are they so important? Well, they're symbols. Baptism is a symbol to everyone else that we have trusted in Jesus as our Savior. Baptism doesn't allow us to go to heaven, but it represents that we have chosen to follow Jesus. 
And when we're baptized, we're showing a picture or a symbol of what Christ did for us. When we go under the water, we're representing how he died and was buried. And then when we come up, we show that he rose from the dead. What about the Lord's Supper? Jesus took the cup of wine and said it was a symbol for what? His blood. And the bread was a symbol of what? His body that was broken for us. Every time we take the Lord's Supper, it is a beautiful reminder of how Jesus gave his life so our sins can be forgiven. Why are baptism and the Lord's Supper so important? Why do we do them in the church? Because they are symbols that God has set up, reminders of the gospel, the good news of Jesus making a way for us to go to heaven. This week, your family can talk more about baptism and the Lord's Supper at kids.westby.org. Have a great week.